Security uh, Workshop. Uh, we're going to get started here. We've got a couple logistics items and then we'll get going. But uh, first, while you have a chance, the Wi Fi details, if you're interested in the Wi Fi, is on the screen. So, uh, this will be up for a second or two before we move on. If you want to take a picture or write it down or, or, uh, or memorize it quickly. All right, great. We'll let everyone get settled in here. Well, again, welcome. Uh, I've got a few things to say, but first I want to ask uh, Kim Collins, who's from the Little America, to come on up, and he's going to uh, give us a safety message uh, for, for today. Good morning. Or if you were in Hawaii, aloha. Some people might think you were in, uh, in uh, Siberia today because our weather has changed dramatically in the last 10 days. For those of you that were thinking you were coming here for summer uh, weather, it was that about 10 days ago. But uh, uh, we certainly uh, would like to extend a very warm welcome to you and your, your attendees to coming to Grand America, Little America for your event here. On behalf of the security team, I'm one of a member of about five, 15, excuse me, 15 security agents that provide a 24 seven security presence at the hotel. So at any given time that you may need security, um, we are here and available for your needs. Uh, regarding uh, the security and the safety, which I've been asked to address very briefly uh, for fire safety, Particularly, we do have these stairwells that are available on the east and west side of the property. So, picture yourself right in the middle, uh, depending on if you're staying in the tower, that would be applicable to you for the fire exits to the east and west. And then we coordinate uh, at ground level and would uh, send you to the appropriate uh, area which generally is speaking is 500 south that probably doesn't mean much to most of you but that's the area that we relocate to in the event that a fire alarm should go off uh, you should note uh, again generally speaking in the fire or excuse me in the tower rooms the alarm is going to sound for the floor above and the floor uh, below and uh, you would hear a prompt, generally speaking, um, uh, informing you of the nature of the alarm. And the alarm is handled through a, uh, an alarm system throughout the hotel that is directed to the security office. And uh, agents are then dispatched to the location to determine the validity of whether it's a fire or not. So generally speaking, within about three minutes, we know whether that's something that you would need to proceed uh, in an orderly fashion to evacuate. Fortunately for us, we've not had to do that uh, uh, in the five years that I've been here. So um, we also have, uh, in addition to our uh, our fire alarm system, we do have our first aid uh, that we do provide a security agent's basic first aid. Um, including we have an AED that's at our uh, our main front desk here at Little America. Uh, should a situation arise, we do recommend uh, that you first, uh, if you can reach out to our front desk people, agents will be dispatched to come and assess the situation. In the event that uh, uh, more medical service is needed, then we have our Salt Lake City Fire Department that responds very quickly and uh, to make additional assessments uh, and to make a determination what the course of action is best. Um, the other thing to keep in mind, um, in the event that there is any type of emergency, we ask that uh, you remain calm um, and uh, reach out to us and we then can help you in coordinating where you need to go. Um, the last thing and the most important thing that we always ask all of our guests is to be uh, conscientious of people that are coming in and out. If you happen to see people that are uh, in the conference area that you don't recognize, please let us know so that we can confirm that they are part of your uh, 
event here and if they're not we can either direct them to where they need to go or direct them off our property that's it in a nutshell uh, again on behalf of the hotel we do welcome you for those of you that uh, really want to have some very good food while you're here make sure that you uh, uh, visit our lucky h or a coffee shop which has great food so again thank you and uh, again my name is kim collins in security uh, put this note down just for a, a, a reference. Um, any phone that you pick up is 26986. 26986 will give you a direct line to security, and then we can respond and help you as necessary. Thank you. All right, well, welcome everybody. Uh, we'll officially kick off the reliability and security workshop. We're excited to have everybody here uh, in Wex backyard, so to speak, in beautiful Salt Lake City. Uh, yeah, it's definitely snowy outside, uh, but uh, if you like to ski, we've got seven uh, world-class ski resorts within about 45 minutes of this location. So uh, uh, the, the Salt Lake City area hosted the Winter Olympics in 2002. I think they're the finalist uh, and the favored uh, for the 2034 Winter Olympics. So certainly uh, a lot you can do, even if it's not uh, sunny. Um, but I will warn for those of you who aren't from uh, this area and maybe come from lower elevations, uh, the higher altitude here, we're at about 4,200 feet, I think, uh, can can make you quite thirsty. So uh, make sure you're drinking plenty of water. That was something I had to get used to myself when I, when I moved here was to drink a lot of water. Um, it's also the second driest state behind Nevada here. And I think we have about 300 sunny days a year, but today is definitely um, not one of them. Uh, but if this is your uh, you know, first workshop, your 10th workshop, regardless of how often you've been coming here, uh, we do look forward to sharing our perspectives with all of you today. Uh, I am kind of curious, though, for how many of you, uh, if you just want to raise your hands, how many of you are here for the first time, first uh, reliability and security workshop? Or so? Oh, wow, that's quite a showing. Excellent, excellent. Um, how about kind of on the other end of the spectrum? Anybody been to maybe, I don't know, 10 or more of these? Wow, definitely have some veterans. Well, how about going way back? Any of you been doing uh, reliability standards and compliance work since uh, since June of 2007? Excellent. Wow. Okay. Well, it's a great uh, great diversity of uh, of experience here. So, welcome to everybody, uh, whether you've been here uh, for one or not. But just thank you for for, for coming. Um, we have about 250 people registered in person. Uh, we also have a hybrid option, so some folks uh, are listening uh, uh, via our, our stream, and, and so we welcome them as well. Thank you. Welcome regardless of how you're present with us. Um, uh, I'm also pretty excited that we have a lot of WEX staff here. Uh, our headquarters is here in town, and so we uh, had a great opportunity to bring a lot of people here. And there's a lot of people that have done a lot of work to put together uh, a really great uh, uh, workshop for everybody and so we've got our meeting staff strategic engagement administrative support and of course members of our reliability and security oversight organization uh, and, and there's even uh, members of wex executive team that are here or will be here throughout uh, the workshop so we look forward to getting the chance to, to to meet everybody if we could i don't mean to embarrass everybody you know from wex staff but i would ask if you could just stand up for a moment just let everyone see who you are please and 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 for everybody you know yeah definitely go find them on the breaks introduce yourselves and get to know them. They're here to, to get to know you better and to, to help uh, with that partnership. I think we have an exciting agenda this week. Um, we've really been on a long journey since mandatory and enforceable standards began. And, uh, you know, as we saw, some of you have been with us since that time uh, first kicked off. Some of you are newer to the space, uh, but I think that what you're going to hear from the presenters this week is really focused on our partnership and, and how we seek to understand, uh, how we look in the work that we do to understand how well entities design and implement your programs, how effective you are, how well entities are able to identify and mitigate their own risks to reliability and security. Certainly the notion of compliance and enforcement is an underpinning of our jurisdiction, but it's not it's not why we do what we do. We do it to support reliability and security. And, and that's why this is the reliability and security workshop, not the compliance enforcement workshop. Uh, we focus on performance controls. We try to uh, have outreach like this to, to have dialogue so that uh, uh, 
we can best support our obligations that we have to understand that as part of what we do. And, and that's underpinned in our rules of procedures that guide the work that we do. Uh, we're, we're required to base our programs on professional auditing standards. And those auditing standards have a really strong underpinning of ensuring that we understand uh, how well entities uh, do risk identification, risk mitigation, and implement control. So uh, we look forward to sharing a lot through that lens with you all this week. And uh, we think our perspective will help bring that to you a little bit because we have experience uh, and, and we have more than 400 registered entities now. So we have experience that spans a lot of different types of entity types. And uh, we certainly uh, uh, hope that that comes across through the, the presentations this week. And do you have a couple of logistics items? If we go to the next slide, please. <clears throat> So the first is our next workshop. We used to have one workshop a year, and historically it was uh, in the fall. And before pa the pandemic, we would have two workshops a year, and, and, and we started to only go to one. And we had some feedback that people were interested in more than one. Uh, and so this is our attempt to, to try to, to reprogram in two workshops a year. Uh, and the next one is in Portland, Oregon. It'll be October 29th and 30th. Uh, we anticipate having a similar format to this where uh, we partner with uh, the WICF uh, on the back side of that as well. Uh, and, and we'll be continuing to evaluate for 2025 and beyond in terms of you know, what the format looks like and how frequently and how often we do them uh, based on feedback that we got in the October workshop from last year along with feedback that we'll get from you this year. But uh, uh, we look forward to, to hosting that and, and hope that uh, many of you uh, will watch for the announcement for that and, and join us there as well. Uh, next slide, please. All right. So tonight we do have a reception following. It'll be right back behind you where uh, we entered the, the, the room here. Uh, so that'll be from 4.30 to 6.30. Uh, you should have received a water bottle when you registered. So inside that water bottle is a, a ticket for um, a, a beverage as well. So uh, make sure you don't lose that water bottle or you, you snatch that uh, ticket out before you do something else with it. Um, there'll be a cash bar as well. So uh, if you can't find your ticket or, or uh, uh, want something else, you can you can avail yourself of that. Um, and we have uh, a lot of exhibitors that have that have helped to uh, sponsor components of, of this workshop too. And so uh, they'll be there as well, and you'll be able to interact with and talk to those exhibitors. And so we thank we thank them uh, for their contribution as well. Next slide. All right. The dine around. Uh, certainly people are connecting with people that they may know or that they came with and are, are free and welcome to, to do whatever uh, 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 they'd like for dinner. But we've tried to also make some options available for people using the Whova app. And so if you go uh, into the Whova app, there's a community tab. And then inside that community tab, there's a meetups and virtual meets. Uh, and some of the WEC staff have developed uh, some reservations and and created an opportunity for people to sign up to join them for for dinner. So you can go do that. You can also create your own. If anyone wants to create their own dine around, um, you're free to do that, and people can join that and meet up and and go have dinner. So we've had some success with this in past events, and uh, just wanted to make sure everyone's aware and 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 knows where that is in 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 the app. <clears throat> All right, next slide, please. Okay, so the antitrust policy. This is the exciting part of. Uh, of, of my presentation uh, is the antitrust policy and it's all WEC meetings are conducted in accordance with their antitrust policy and the NERC antitrust compliance guidelines. So we all must comply with this. And I also note that this is a public meeting. Uh, as I mentioned, we're streaming it for participants that are watching uh, as well. And so confidential or proprietary, proprietary information should not be discussed in open sessions. All right, great. Uh, we're recording it. So uh, those participants that are that are participating remotely, uh, <clears throat> And and those that may want, uh, you know, that we may want to, to look in the future. So we're recording it, and we'll post uh, this publicly to those folks that have registered. Uh, you give your consent for your name, voice, image, and likeness to be included in that recording. Uh, we do try to make sure that the information is accurate and reflects our views. And I think that's an important con component too of the perspectives that we share. Of part of what WEC has the, the the opportunity to interact with so many entities when we see things. Uh, that we think are pretty successful. We like to build that into our programs that we share with you in, in, in venues like this today. Uh, but all interpretations and positions are subject to change. And if you have any questions, please contact WEX Legal Counsel, which we can help direct you to if, if, if you should so need. Great, so now how do we ask a question? We do have microphones up and they're in the aisles. You can see them right here. 
Um, we ask that you go uh, and stand behind the microphone should you have a question during the presentation. I think most presenters are, are pretty good at uh, being able to ask questions along the way, but uh, uh, we'll, we'll try to help facilitate uh, the, the, the question and answer component. Uh, for the virtual attendees, um, we do ask that you submit those questions through uh, the platform that you're using to, to view the video, the WebEx or the Whova app. And um, as we get through the live attendees questions, should we have time at the end, uh, we'll, we'll ask those live. And if not, we'll take those after the conference and, and formulate uh, some responses to those. <clears throat> Next, uh, I, I want to introduce our keynote speaker, and it's really my pleasure to, to welcome her here this morning. I'm Melanie Fry. She's uh, WEX President and CEO, uh, and she's been serving in that capacity at WEX since 2018. Uh, she joined WEX in 2007 as Director of Human Resources, uh, and she came from Pacific Corps before that, so a long history in our industry. She served as WEX Vice President of Shared Services and then later as Vice President of Reliability Planning and Performance Analysis before being named as CEO. Uh, Melanie has really been instrumental in my view uh, in strengthening our leadership culture at WEC. Uh, she created a framework for our invented future where WEC is the voice of reliability and she continues to lead our transformation within the organization. So please join me in giving Melanie a warm welcome as our keynote speaker this morning. Good morning, and thank you for that warm welcome. Um, it's hard to believe that 2007 was so long ago. Um, one of the things I've learned in this industry is time flies, and uh, it feels like just yesterday. Um, it's also great to see so many familiar faces in the audience. Uh, many of the folks here are former WEC employees, and so it was wonderful to reconnect with all of you. I think that's something that I've come to recognize about this industry, though, is our wires are connected, but so are our people. And that's one of the, the great joys of this workshop, is it lets the people who are really on the front lines connecting, um, ma making sure that we're reliable and secure, lets you connect with each other. So if I may, for those who've been around in this world since 2007, can I ask you to raise your hand one more time, please? So first, thank you. Second, I would encourage those of you who are new and for whom this is your first workshop to find one of these people and introduce yourself. Um, I have never met a person in this interconnection who isn't eager to share what they've learned and, and the knowledge they have. So encourage you to do that as well. I will add just one more fun fact to uh, what Steve said. So not only are we at elevation of 4,300-ish in, in Salt Lake City, and that does make you thirsty. Sometimes that thirst might be in the form of alcohol. So there are people who are prone to elevation or altitude related illnesses. And for some people, the alcohol can hit a bit stronger. So just word of caution, if you wanna come back tomorrow, make sure that, that you drink plenty of water along with whatever else you're consuming during the dine around. Uh, the other fun fact I'll share is some of you may not know why WEC is located in Salt Lake City. Um, if you get the chance to go outside and look toward the mountains, that's the east side, on the, the base of those mountains, you'll see the campus of the University of Utah. And back in 1967, when the precursor to WEC was formed, uh, Western Systems Coordinating Council, Really, the only place that had a computer big enough to run the, the models of the interconnection was at the University of Utah. So that's the precursor. And uh, Jay, I don't mean to embarrass you, but we had a wonderful uh, presentation from Jay Luke. Jay, wave, please. Jay is one of our uh, long-serving employees at 42 or 43? 42. 42 years with WEC. And at a, a staff presentation last year, he brought some of the original cards that were taken over to the university and would run the programs and the models so that we could assess the reliability of the grid. Today, you probably have more computing power in this little device you're carrying. And some of our employees are running these models remotely at home on their laptops, maybe sitting in their jammies at the kitchen counter. So we've come a long way as an industry and as WEC as well. 
Uh, so Steve talked about the community that exists within this world and the ability for, for you all to learn from each other. Um, keeping the lights on, in my view, is really a team sport. Um, it requires everyone, the generators, the transmission owners and operators, the planners, the coordinators, the regulators, the, the other stakeholders. Um, it, it requires all of us to be engaged and, and focus on a common mission, which at WEC we view as um, to effectively and efficiently mitigate the risks to reliability and security. For those of you who've been around for a while, you know that those risks back in the early days of the, the mandatory standards, they were pretty well understood. Uh, we had a pretty stable grid and when change occurred, it might just be one change, maybe a retirement of a plant or the development of, of a new uh, generating re resource. But over the next two days, we're going to dig into the aspects of this industry that continue to change. And we'll spend time talking about the work we do in registration, certification, compliance monitoring and enforcement programs, which we collectively refer to as our reliability and security oversight. Um, it's really a, an intentional choice that we made to call it reliability and security oversight instead of, as Steve said, compliance monitoring and enforcement. And that's because it's a mindset. We're here for reliability and security. Uh, for me, compliance would simply be checking a box and saying, yep, we're compliant, we're gonna move on. And more and more, we're uh, changing that mindset, changing that focus to what are the actions needed to have a highly reliable and secure grid. So it isn't just about being compliant or not compliant. It's really about how well your programs are uh, developed and how effectively they're implemented. And you're on the front lines of doing that every day. Uh, so while non-compliance and, and enforcement actions are a potential outcome of our oversight activities, that's not the reason we do what we do. Just as we know, it's not the reason you do what you do. It's really to serve that core function of electricity for our society. And I think that um, is becoming increasingly important as our world transitions to even more things being electrified. So we do talk a lot about risks to reliability here at WEC, and there are many, um, from the retirement of existing generating resources to the addition of new types of generation, new technologies that bring with them both opportunities and challenges, to the more frequent extreme weather events. And here in the West, we've experienced both the heat and the cold, and the ever-growing demand for electricity that's coming from transportation and home heating electrification, to just name a few. And I don't think any conversation is ever complete if we don't mention the physical and cybersecurity threats uh, that are increasing every day. So uh, I like the phrase, and I won't take credit for, for coining this, but it's everything, everywhere, all at once. And it, it's, you know, someone will ask me, what is the biggest risk to reliability? And I often say it's, it's a hard question to answer. And it's kind of like if you ask me which of my children is my favorite, it depends on the day, what's happening. So I think the same is true for the risks to reliability. Uh, so much like the grid has evolved over the last decade, so too has the way we think about our role in mitigating the risks. Today and in the future, our focus is to be an organization around, uh, organized around risk reduction with a holistic risk-based approach and using all of the tools that are available to us. We've talked about our value proposition being our independence, our partnership, and our perspective. And those things can at time feel a little bit at odds. Um, we are a unique organization with an interconnection wide view of reliability and we have access to lots of data and information and, and visibility. And so we work very hard to try and turn that into useful insights uh, for, for all of you. As a regulator, our philosophy is to apply a risk analysis to everything that we do. And I think that really underscores how our oversight role can, can actually um, fit and coexist with partnership mindsets. 
So while we're an independent organization in our exercise of our delegated regulatory authority, we partner with entities and organizations. And this is an example. Uh, WICF is a great example, and we're very proud to continue that partnership and know that many of you will be staying over uh, another day and a half in, in your WICF meeting. Um, we do this in support of our common reliability goal. And then at WEC, our broad uh, interactions throughout the interconnection and the ERO enterprise allow us to provide a unique perspective back to you, the stakeholders on the front lines. One of the specific actions that we've taken at WEC is to create a centralized risk group. So if I go back a few years ago and think about when WEC would put out a statement talking about risk, you always had to ask the question, was well, this coming from the compliance and uh, monitoring and enforcement mindset, or is it coming from what we call our RAPA organization, which is reliability planning and performance analysis? And at times those two had a different answer as to how we were viewing risks and the, and the direction we were um, trying to give out to industry. So we've uh, set ourselves our, our future and the way we're going to be thinking about this is to create a holistic view of risk that can then feed both of those program areas. Uh, we have a centralized department who then works very closely with our strategic engagement, outreach and communications teams to make sure we disseminate that information in as, as broad of a way possible and speaking with one voice on the risks to reliability and security. So I'm hoping you'll start to see um, more of that coming in in the, the coming weeks and months. Um, in addition, we have a stakeholder committee called the Reliability Risk Committee. So we also are known for our acronyms. So you'll hear it called the RRC. And they uh, are working on a process now to refresh the RRP, the Reliability Risk Priorities. So, you know, if only we had more letters in the alphabet, we could make more acronyms and initialisms. Um, but I call your attention to that because in the next week, we will be posting a first draft of that refreshed work. And we would uh, welcome and encourage stakeholder input and comments on those risks as that will be presented to our board in June uh, for approval and then uh, incorporation into both our staff work plans and our uh, technical committee work plans in the coming years. Um, so I want to take a few minutes and, and talk about, we've formed this new group, we have an internal view where we're looking at a holistic view of, of risk. How's that showing up in our work? Uh, we have a couple of examples that we want to show. One of them is in responding to cold weather preparedness. Um, I'll give a recent example of how this holistic view works. Um, as, as you're probably aware, if, if, you're, um, if you've been involved in this for a while and, and as you're new, you're coming up to speed on uh, the situations that have happened with cold weather. Dating all the way back to 2011, the first big event that had electric system impact uh, from a cold weather event uh, was in, as I said, 2011 where we had unplanned generation unit outages. And um, most recently, we had the 2021 and uh, winter storm Uri, and 2022 winter storm Elliot. Um, I didn't know there were names for storms, but this is, this is a thing now. Um, uh, the ERO Enterprise recently announced that we would be launching uh, a review of the, the 2024 storms, Heather and Jerry. So, by June of this year, you'll see an updated report because um, we're trying to assess, are we getting better? As, as an industry, are we getting better at responding and, and preventing the impacts of these cold weather storms? So that was a little bit of an aside. Um, but take, going back to the centralized view of risk, we coordinated across our organization to um, take a cohesive approach in how we were going to conduct some reviews and assessments leading into 2023-2024 winter. So um, our team working across the silo, uh, centralized group identified that the, the uh, generation in the Western interconnection that was most um, susceptible to cold weather impacts and then we were able to use a cross-functional approach to confirm winter weather preparedness. 
um, making sure that entities had adopted recommendations and had plans for for winter. Fast forward to uh, today and going forward, we now have uh, cold weather standards that will be going into effect and uh, they'll need to continue to be developed as we learn. Uh, we'll be using our oversight planning work to ensure that our CMEP activities are um, are tailored to this risk and that we can help entities understand and respond to those risks. The second area that I would like to share is related to grid transformation. And I know a hot topic within all of industry right now is the um, changing resource mix, the retirement of our traditional generating resources, and introduction of new inverter-based resource, resources such as utility-scale solar, wind, and even battery technologies. Um, with them come both opportunities and challenges. So since the uh, initial event that was attributed to um, inverter-based resources, the Blue Cut Fire, uh, that report was introduced in 2017, which feels like just a few minutes ago, but um, we've got a lot of uh, lessons learned over the last several years, and there have been several additional events since that time. So on the one hand, we're learning, and on the other hand, we maybe are being a little slow to adopt some of the best practice recommendations in order to respond to these challenges. So um, WEC, working with NERC and the other five regional entities across North America, um, we're dedicated to identifying and addressing these challenges associated with inverter-based resources because we know the penetration is going to continue to increase. Uh, recent ERO enterprise assessments identified a gap in reliability associated with the increasing um, penetration of inverter-based resources and undertook some work. So if we look back at when the original uh, bulk electric system um, definition was created, it applied to uh, about 97% of the conventional generation. And that gave a good foundation or a good confidence level that um, the, the large majority of resources were subject to these mandatory standards. As the resource mix has changed and evolved, um, an analysis that was done back in 2021 revealed that less than 85% of the inverter-based resource generation was covered by the similar standards. So that meant they weren't um, following the same rules and requirements that other generation was, which in our view creates a risk to reliability. Um, as the gap became more clear and more events were started to be seen, FERC issued an order in 2022, Order 901, uh, directing NERC and the regions to identify and register owners and operators of these currently unregistered BES connected elements. So based on the current estimates of the work underway, uh, we expect that this will get us just over 97% of these resources. So it'll be back on par with uh, conventional generation. The work is progressing quickly. And just last month, the NERC Board of Trustees modified the registration criteria uh, to support registration of these inverter-based resources. And just last week, the revisions were filed with FERC with a request that FERC expedite their review and approval. Uh, so this is an example of the, the pace at which uh, standards need to be modified and evolved. You know, as the grid is changing, we have to contemporize these standards and, and it will, you know, as you, as you all well know, uh, increase the volume of things that you're paying attention to. Um, but we think it's absolutely essential to mitigating the risks and assuring that we continue to keep the lights on. Uh, so through this centralized risk view that we maintain at WAC, um, we also intend to, as, as cohesively and comprehensively as possible, um, prepare our strategies and then the, the piece that we're really trying to put some emphasis on is our outreach and coordination to make sure as we are getting new entrants into the system, new companies who've never really uh, been part of the reliability ecosystem, we, we need to bring them up to speed. And so I suspect over the coming years, we'll see then the number of chairs in this room filled uh, grow 
there'll be new people to welcome into our regime and, and make friends with so we can help them understand what their part is in keeping the lights on. Um, so on the topic of inverter-based resources, uh, we've introduced last year and continuing into this year what we call our reliability discussion series. These have been very well attended uh, webinar events that are helping some of our newer stakeholders, uh, for example, state regulators and policymakers and others, um, better understand the reliability risks ahead of us. We have one coming up next week. Um, and this one will focus in on uh, the, the purpose and impact of these modified registration requirements. So if it's uh, something that you're eager to learn more about, uh, feel free to check out our website and you'll see the registration information. Uh, that webinar is on Wednesday, April 3rd. Um, so all of this just uh, summarizes to say the voice of reliability is becoming increasingly critical. And that's what we here at WEC are focused on, um, using our authorities, using our um, ability to talk with all of the participants, all of the stakeholder groups within the Western Interconnection to really keep that focus on reliability. So I want to end by recognizing and thanking you for all of the work that you do to keep the lights on. For those of you who've been involved in this industry from pre-2007 and mandatory standards to those who might be taking on your first compliance or uh, related job in your utility. Uh, we're grateful for all of the work that you do and uh, hope that you see us as a partner in helping you because we all have the same goal, which is a highly reliable and securable power system. So I wish you well. Um, I'll be around and I'd love to chat with any of you at the break. Um, love to see you at lunchtime today. Um, wish you well for a very successful conference. Thanks. Thanks very much, Melanie. Uh, we'll get moving here in a little bit. Um, so a solar panel and a wind turbine were hanging out and the solar panel said to the wind turbine, what do you think about all this grid transformation stuff? The turbine said, I'm a big fan. Meanwhile, there was a battery energy storage system and he was like, I don't mean to eavesdrop, but I'm pretty charged up myself. So anyway, uh, we're gonna introduce some directors today too. So uh, on our team, we've got uh, uh, Kim Israelson, uh, Deb McIndiffer and Jimmy Klein, and they're gonna take over the MC duties throughout today and tomorrow. So welcome, Kim. So I love Steve's jokes. He told me one about a small zoo that I share with my family often. So catch me on the break and I'll share it with you. Um, I want to thank Melanie for starting us off and really sharing why WEC is in Salt Lake and also the challenges that we're facing with grid transformation. In that light, you will hear in this next session from NERC how they prioritized standard development projects and upcoming changes to inverter-based and distributed energy resources, along with the response to FERC Order 901. So please join me in welcoming Latrice Harkness, excuse me, Director, Standards Development, and Jamie Calderon, Manager, Standards Development from NERC. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Thank you. So did you write that joke or did you get that out of a book like dad jokes? Like where'd that come from? Half and half. All right. Well, for those of you who do not know me, my name is Latrice Harkness and I've been at NERC um, almost 10 years now. And I started out in registration and certification, moved over to standards, worked for Steve a little bit um, as a standards developer. And now as I stated, I'm the Director of Standards Development. I report to Sue Jen, and I have two managers that work alongside me, Allison Oswald and Jamie Calderon. Before I start, I want to say thank you to um, everyone here at WEC that um, coordinated all of the emails, all of the dry runs, all of the um, updates to our presentation and slide deck that you will see before you today. 
I want to say to Melanie that I echo and agree with everything you said from the acronyms to the IBR work to NERC is very busy right now. And um, if I can't stress that enough, we are very busy. And this is the busiest that I have ever been at NERC in my life. So um, with that, I ask for a little bit of grace um, with the process and the prioritization, but just thank you again for your partnership as well. And we appreciate you all so much um, in this effort because it's big and it's important. Um, so thank you again for those words. So NERC prioritization, um, and just one other aside before I start, if you all have looked at the agenda and you see the names of these uh, sessions. This one is called Unlocking the Secrets of NERC Standards Development. Who came up with that name? Who, 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 like, who did that? And so I'm thinking, like, what's a good joke that I could tell about unlocking the secrets of NERC? Do we have secrets? Like, what in the world? So I don't think we have secrets. The standards development process is pretty transparent, so it's kind of transparent, secret, no. Okay, so that's all I got with that. Um, <laughs> this is my first time in Salt Lake City. The mountains are beautiful, and so thank you all for having me out here. So if we can move to the first slide, please, in the presentation. The objective of this presentation is to understand how NERC's work plan priorities and FERC directives shape the current standards development project prioritization and to provide public awareness to you all of those prioritizations and to help assist industry in allocation of resources and efforts. And as I said, we are very busy and I'm sure you are very busy as well. And so we're trying to make this um, kind of simple and as easy, but make sure that it all comes together. So if there's any other recommendations or thoughts you have, please come see me after the presentation. Next slide, please. I'm gonna start with the high priority projects. There are 11, and what you'll see um, when you go to our NERC.com site and our, pro our reliability standards under development, we have kind of rearranged our page to show our high, medium, and low priority projects, and you'll also see when those projects are scheduled to be completed. So our high priority projects are projects that have FERC directives associated with them as well as board resolutions. And this is where the Order 901 work with the IBR comes in. There's a couple of SIP projects on there that you'll see as well. And also we have elevated the 2026-06 that incorporates the IBR definitions as well to go along with this. We have other anticipated SARS, and Jamie's going to talk in depth about the Order 901 work plan and just the whole process that we're going through from 2024 to 2026 to have those standards um, adopted, well, presented and adopted by our board based on the Order 901 in those tranches that um, FERC listed in there. So what we're doing right now with those SARs, we're working with the RSTC and the working groups up under there to provide their input on those SARs, and NERC will be developing a number of those SARs themselves, but we'll be able to get the comment periods out to let people chime in and help us refine those SARs before we bring them to the Standards Committee. Looking at the 2024 board adoption dates, We've already, as um, Melanie stated as well, we filed the cold weather standards and we're waiting on FERC to act, act right now. Um, and that's all I'll say about those cold weather standards right now for those of you who are following the news and following that process. Um, for May, we're looking at bringing to the board the internal network security monitoring and virtualization. Let's get a woohoo for virtualization. A 2016 project, yes, thank you very much. Um, we will be bringing that to the board in May as well. October, we'll be looking at bringing those Order 901 um, standards projects because we have to file those with FERC by November. And then in December, you'll see the remaining projects that are listed as high priority coming. So if we move to the next slide, please. This is just a cute little visual aid to show you all of the high priority projects. And so when you look um, going to from left to right um, in those columns, you'll see these are the projects that are associated with the IBR work plan. You'll see the SIP in the middle column, and then you'll see those um, surrounding extreme weather and energy in the last column. Now, just to highlight here, under the first column, the modifications to PRC2 and the IBR definitions are out now for an additional comment period and ballot. Performance of IBRs is out for an initial. 
going on over to the last column, extreme weather is posted for an initial comment period. And in the middle, internal network security monitoring just closed, but it did not pass, but we did receive a 48.52 approval rating. And for the low impact, it did not pass as well. However, we received a 60.34 approval rating. And so if you know the magic number is 66.67, we're not far off, we're close. So there's, there's still some work to be done and the drafting teams are reviewing those comments right now. Um, and we'll be looking to post those again for some additional ballots as well. Next slide, please. So the medium and low priority projects, there are 13. And what we agreed upon, and we're sharing with industry, that we will not be posting any of the medium or low priority projects for the first half of 2024. Now, mind you, we're already in March, we're close to April. We'll be reevaluating this around the May, June timeline. And if anything changes with this, we will let industry know as well. But we will be posting some projects for informal comment period during this time, just not anything that industry will vote on. As I stated, this priority process is very fluid um, and it's moving. And so we are talking about it daily, but hopefully this gives you an outline of where we stand currently as of today. And these medium and low priority projects will be planned to have board adoption in 2025 and beyond. Next slide, please. So this is the medium priority projects that you see here. And one thing that I wanna point out on this one is project 2023-09, um, the risk management for third party cloud services. This is our cloud SAR, and we haven't initiated this project yet, but we wanted to make sure that it stayed visible. So we gave it a project number and you can see the information on our project page. Another SAR that I wanna point out that um, we wanted to make sure that it remained visible as well. We updated our SAR page, the SIP 13 SAR for the supply chain. Um, the SC sent that back to the supply chain working group, but that is being reviewed right now by the supply chain working group and just wanted you to be aware of that as well. So if we could go to the next slide, please. These are our low priority projects. And you see, we still have a 2017 <laughs> project on here, the BAL. Um, we're looking for a way to off ramp that project if possible. Um, and some of these will be moved up in the priority as we get closer to those due dates from the order 901. And so you'll see some of those other IBR projects here that haven't been elevated quite yet. Next slide, please. So in conclusion, just to let you know um, what we're doing with this prioritization, there have been SARS that will continue to um, be submitted by feedback loops. And we've, some, we've received some from compliance feedback loops as well as anybody in the industry can submit a SAR. And so those will be worked into the process as we continue on. And then we have a list of SARS. Um, I say five here, but Jamie may have a different number because we just finished truing up our work plan and the di directives identified in order 901. Can anybody guess how many directives were in that order? Yes. Yes, close, 6364. And so we had to true up with FERC because FERC were, was like, yeah, we have a different number than you all have. And so some of them are soft directives. And so we just we just had a meeting with FERC to, to shore that up. And so we will be putting everything that we have um, concerning the order not on one work plan on our website. We just wanted to make sure that our information is correct um, and is accurate. And so that will be forthcoming after um, maybe in, in the next week or so as, as we get that out. But yes, 60 something directives in this one order that we have to meet over the next three years. So in closing, I'd just like to say again, thank you. We are very busy, very, very busy. Um, but I am excited about the work. I'm excited about the reliability that all of this is going to bring. Um, and just to close with what Melanie said about moving these standards forward. It is a consensus building process and we understand that. However, in order for us to keep the lights on, we need that consensus to be built a little bit quicker. 
<laughs> than it is. And so just stay tuned for some other things that will be coming from standards as we explore different ways to kind of um, make the standards development process more agile and to move it along quicker than it moves now. And we won't have those 2016 and 2017 projects lingering out here for so long. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Jamie Calderon. Calderon. We're gonna save the questions until the end when she finishes the work plan overview. All right, good morning. Uh, 901 is definitely a hot topic today. So really uh, appreciative to WEC and for the comments earlier today. It's, I, I like the idea of an ecosystem an ecology of, of groups and people getting together where things start to move forward very quickly and someone thinks that somebody else has it. So this information, um, of course, have the clicker up here. Perfect. Um, this information is about 901. We've done a couple of these updates today and really it's not enough information that we can get out there. We're trying to, as Latrice said, put information on the website. We're recording a webinar this Thursday. But what we want to get out of this course is really just a holistic set of information for what are our approaches to addressing 901. We have to move quickly. Um, the correction on it being three years is actually two and a half and counting uh, down. Uh, so we want to create public awareness of the scope of the incoming changes. You know, not only um, you know are these 901 directives out, but there's other directives that uh, are associated with standard projects that we're advancing as well. So we have to keep this uh, flux of reprioritization of projects. There could be more directives that come out over the next year or two, and I almost guarantee it. Uh, so we're gonna have to have more uh, flexibility for these projects. So it's building that awareness, what's changing, why it's changing, what are the deadlines and what's involved is all incredibly important information. Getting it concise when it's this giant ball of yarn that is 901 is challenging. Uh, so it's getting more uh, opportunities like this. Thank you again to WEC for uh, letting us come here today. We wanna to promote early and active participation in projects. Uh, we're onboarding more people. It's still surprising to me how few people uh, real or don't realize that industry writes the standards. You know, it's a NERC facilitated process. Uh, we have developers that ensure the projects stay on track, that, that's got all the information that meets the objectives in there, but it's volunteers from industry who are working full-time jobs who come and participate in the standards development process. So, and, and we can't thank our volunteers enough because they come and work on teams that are being asked to meet several times a week for hours on end and then develop the process and then having to answer questions to industry it's challenging, uh, but it's not just one person alone. It's never just one team member or group of team members alone. It's a, it's a whole process. So this presentation is part informational, part call to action. If you're not involved in a standards development project and you're interested, please consider that. Or if you know someone who's an expert in the fields that we're talking about, that's in your group or your company, uh, have them consider at least observing some of the projects, shadowing. Uh, they don't have to be a full-fledged team member to participate. Don't just wait for the comment periods, like get involved early. These things have to move quickly and we wanna make sure all of the information is available to people and people can participate in the process as much as possible. Now, quick overview on 901. FERC issues uh, a, a nice holiday surprise uh, just before the holidays every year, and last year was no different. Uh, we were expecting it. There was a NOPER that had, which is a notice of proposed rulemaking, industry comments, and then eventually there's a set of directives that come out in an order. As uh, noted, there is five dozen plus uh, directives and soft directives, which may not say NERC shall or NERC uh, uh, must, but say it's like, this process should as a follow up sentence. So that type of thing we're trying to collect and make sure that we identify each of these individual objectives uh, within this uh, comprehensive work plan that we're going to be updating and putting on our website. Now, by the numbers, uh, there are four milestone dates uh, through November 2026, and that's two and a half years away. We've already passed milestone one, uh, and I'll, I'll go through them in a little bit more detail, but 
901 addresses a wide spectrum of IBR related performance issues, modeling issues, how studies use that data. It's a wide variety of different components. Um, it's easy to see how an individual project that just takes that information and as a general, like a normal project would, they have a set of uh, objectives in their SAR, which is the standard authorization request, and they go and develop the project. But these cannot be done in isolation. Some of these projects feed directly into each other. Uh, for milestone two, as we'll get into, we're doing more information together, joint webinars, ensuring that the information for how these projects feed into each other and relate to, uh, to each other is information that's available. So we have to ensure that there's a lot of coordination, not just between the projects, um, but between industry at large. What we're doing to move forward has to be this single uh, holistic approach while taking into account industry's uh, preference for a certain language within the standard or certain requirements. So it's this continual kind of balancing act between assuring that we're staying on point with the objectives of the standards, assuring that industry's views are represented within the standards because industry writes the standards and votes on them. Uh, we do have to move quickly. So it's a lot of coordination that has to happen very quickly. Um, I think I used the word last time I presented the word extensive about 12 times. I'm going to try to only use it that one time I just did. Um, but by the numbers, it's four milestones. We're looking at about approximately 10 or more standards development projects right now over the next two and a half years. That is a lot of projects that are related and working together. Now, I spoke about the milestone, so let's talk about what each of those is. The first one was uh, back in January 17th, we were required by FERC to uh, file our work plan, which was what is standards approach gonna be for this ball of yarn that we just gave you just before Christmas. Um, and it was a comprehensive work plan that had some strategy, some things left unfinished uh, or yet to be determined. So there was some information that we needed to fine tune. What are these projects specifically gonna look like over the next year or two? How do the modeling standards need to be changed? What do we need to change to ensure that we not only meet the objectives, uh, but really satisfy how this fits into the current family of standards short of just retiring a bunch of standards and building new ones, because that is an incredibly challenging component, not just from a development standpoint, from an implementation and compliance standpoint, as I'm sure you're all aware. So there's a little bit of work that we were doing in January still. Um, it's been five months since the order came out, and we're in a much better place here than even than we were in January. So we have more information on milestone three and milestone four. Um, so milestone one was really just that first initial work plan. It's currently not on our website other than where it was filed with FERC in that FERC filing. So as Latrice said, starting next week, we're gonna be putting uh, an updated work plan with new information um, and more concise. Some of the feedback we got was this was a lot and, and it was. Um, we're trying to make sure that what you need to know is provided. Um, if you are a regulator, what, are the, what do you need to know? If you are an asset owner, what do you need to know? Trying to retool the information in a way that is more digestible to the various readers that will be looking at it. So there's a, a little bit of information that we're changing. Because of that, uh, we wanna make sure that it's understood. Uh, we wanna have people participating in the process and have the available tools necessary to just jump right in. So this November, 2024, that's November 4th, not even the full month, we have to file milestone two. Um, that's IBR performance based on disturbance monitoring data requirements and post event analytics. We've broken that into a set of directives that are looking at IBR performance to essentially ride through disturbance monitoring events. So voltage and frequency disturbance events. If you have a large number of generators that fail to ride through, which means they either trip unnecessarily or they enter what is momentary cessation or um, where it just stops producing current or active power and injecting that into the system, you will exacerbate system conditions as well we've seen. Uh, there's been a lot of NERC reports and uh, reports with WEC and all the uh, basically in this area, I think blue cut fire was mentioned, but there's been more increasing and the scope and impact of them has been increasing. So 
even if we were to file these in November and get the effective dates over the next couple years uh, and get them implemented, we're still gearing up to see potentially more of those events until more best practices can be initiated uh, or implemented. So we don't just want to wait for the compliance measure. There are best practices there. These are coming. Uh, regulatory directives from FERC are not optional. We won't have the capability of not moving forward with projects in November. One of the key questions that we get is, well, what happens if we fail to pass ballot? It's like, let's just not do that. Let's let's get to a point where over the next couple months that we can iron out the details and come to consensus on what these projects are. There is a failover you know, process for that built into the standards development process, but it's not the best. You know, it, it goes into uh, where NERC has to fulfill its obligation with FERC as um, as the organization to ensure that we meet those directives. So we won't be looking for extension requests. These are overdue to be to be honest. You know, we don't have the capability to get uh, in front of FERC and say that there's not enough risk right now that we can delay another year. We have to move forward. So milestone two is associated with uh, three active projects right now. One is the 202104. It's disturbance monitoring data. We have to install equipment at facilities. A lot of RBR that are out there, utility scale, either currently registered under a, uh, as a generator or a generation asset, or it will soon be after the pending BES, uh, you know, changes go through FERC, where we have a change to our registration criteria, and we're gonna have potentially a lot of new registered entities and very much a lot of new assets. So those are gonna be happening Pretty much in conjunction, um, it's a complication where we have a lot of new IBR being brought into the, uh, the reliability standards realm, in addition to a lot of changes to IBR and how those are treated within reliability standards. That confluence is, is creating a lot of, I, I know, heartache um, or headache. Uh, it's causing a lot of heartburn. There we go. Uh, it's definitely causing me a lot of heartburn, uh, but we definitely have more that we can do there. We're putting more information together. We have a new reliability initiatives page. I'll uh, point to that at the end of the presentation here. But installing new IBR equipment is key. Now, one thing that's not shown here is that 2030 is the final date that all of the directives associated with 901 have to be fully implemented. We don't have the capability to file these standards in November with an implementation of them by 2032. They all have to be implemented by 2030. And they can't all happen on the same day and have 10 different suites of standards or 10 different projects with potentially like 15 or 16 different standards all being implemented on the same day. So we're looking at staggering approaches. We're working with the individual teams. So what's feeding downstream is appropriate. You have to install the monitoring equipment before you can have ride through criteria, before you can update your modeling, before you can update your studies with that ride through capability. It's a one after the other approach. So there's some things that we're trying to keep in mind here with milestone two. Not everyone can just go out and buy equipment all at once and expect that the supply chain that produces and supplies this equipment will will just be able to get that to the facilities. Testing them, installing them is another suite of professionals that aren't going to all be able to work on the same day. So we're looking at what we can do to ensure that there's a meaningful uh, approach, a practical approach to that implementation. So folks can be able to have a plan in place for when they will install, but at least know which units will not have disturbance monitoring equipment installed and provide that information up to planners and coordinators. So it's a lot of collecting the information, installing uh, equipment, and then getting that information out to uh, their planners and operators to incorporate into their own studies and their models. So that's a lot of what happens in milestone two, setting the performance right through criteria. They don't operate the same as synchronous machines. They don't have inertia. So what does that look like from how do they ensure that they remain connected electrically and injecting current? We're looking at a, a separate standard for IBR ride through for that reason. It, it makes it clear when you have very different uh, technology types in, um, that have different operational characteristics, 
in this way, and this is what's been presented by the drafting team. Uh, so, similarly, we've done that with the, the disturbance monitoring equipment as well. There's just that standard for, uh, for IBR being presented. So, please take a look at those. Uh, the third one is 2023-02. That's looking at performance studies. So, if you don't have write-through criteria, you know, being met, or maybe like part of your facility is meeting it, uh, we're looking at how does the overall IBR facility or plant operate. So not individual inverters tripping off for whatever reasons. If it's needed to trip off to protect the generator, we're not looking at that. But if you get into the issue where you have uh, a degradation in the system capability because they haven't as a plant failed to ride through, but enough of the components are failing to ride through that you still recognize a dip in stability in that area uh, or, or system strength, then What's uh, supposed to happen there is 2023-02 comes into play. Planners are able to initiate additional studies and look at analytics to determine if some other criteria needs to be established or some other mitigation needs to be established. Uh, and give, give operators the flexibility to really see what's needed for the system at that area and have additional tools and recourses to implement change. So, in a nutshell, I've got more information on milestone two because we're much further along. Uh, milestone three is modeling data sharing validation. We're looking at uh, updating models to ensure that ride through characteristics are represented. We're looking to have um, new modeling validation tools for IBR. It what what we've been seeing with say mod 33, if you're familiar with that, where planning coordinators have to make small parameter changes is becoming very complicated with IBR. There's a lot of individual vendors with their own individual methods of putting together their model data, and that should be okay. We should be allowing that as long as we have the capability to establish responsibility on the owners and operators to work with their vendors to fix quality model quality issues. So there's some component of that. We're also going to require a standard library of models to be used, and that's essentially milestone three. There will be additional uh, components that have IBR and DER data that is not going to be registered, not currently not going to be registered, but just the data. Uh, operators and planners need to know what does the aggregated IBR and DER look like on their system? And how is that affecting real-time operations? How is that affecting their operational plans? How is that affecting their transmission planning analysis? If it's not being represented, the risk is unknown. And that is the biggest point of that, that, that portion there. Um, we'll have a lot of conversations still to be had on this is outside jurisdiction, but it's not. Impacts to the BPS in aggregate that are causing uh, larger system events, increasing system events, cannot be ignored and must be resolved. So that's what Milestone 3 really gets into the mix, is establishing some updates to models and the aggregation of that data. Milestone 4, a little bit uh, still in the works with FERC. Operational planning studies have to use that. Which ones is a good question. Um, all transmission planning studies, does it have to include the new energy assurance studies? Does it have to include studies on uh, extreme weather? Does it have to be every study that's ever conducted? You know, we have uh, some work that we're still doing to fine tune what that looks like. And uh, we'll be soliciting additional information as well in coordination with FERC. All right, so our overall approach to this is ongoing. It's ongoing prioritization of NERC standards projects. Um, milestone three, we're looking at getting with um, the RSTC, which is the Reliability and Security Technical Committee, that's the group um, uh, you know, facilitated by NERC that has a lot of experts that are focused on IBR. They have different work groups that are looking at IBR and DER, and we're just trying to make sure that we're soliciting feedback with them. Ongoing prioritization, as Latrice messaged, is something that's in flux. We know things currently will have to become high. They're not high yet because we can't have everything be high or prioritization doesn't work. Uh, but we have to make sure that when we change something, it's messaged, it's clear. Uh, the teams know in advance uh, if we're if we have a project that is expected to be high priority, high intensity, meeting twice, three times a week, that is going to be messaged on the front end. Uh, medium low priorities, of course, lower, but it's going to require this continual adjustment. 
continual coordination between not just the developers and the drafting teams, but legal, the RSTC, um, all of the regional entities, our compliance staff. I didn't even put everybody on here. Uh, of course, all of standards in, in all of industry. It's, it's a lot of continual coordination that we have to do. And ongoing communication to industry. You know, we're going to be doing a lot more of these types of presentations where you can give the information that we can. Uh, what we know, when we know it, we're going to update our website. We're going to make sure folks have that information. Again, so continual coordination between uh, NERC engineering, legal, and standards. New SARS that are coming out for Milestone 3 and the SARS yet to be developed for Milestone 4, we want to make sure that we're coordinating on. Not only do they have to have just the directives within, um, you know, that relate to 901, but are inclusive of that overall vision of do they fit the current family of standards? And if not, what needs to change? Um, if this is impacting potentially downstream some other standards, have those been identified? And is there a uh, plan in the works for what that looks like? Does there need to be a phase two already established for, okay, well, we're changing the model. So what is this other standard that uses that data get impacted and when? And is that a high priority or a low priority? We're, we're going to continue to have those conversations and message that. Um, so that upstream downstream projects coordination is really what that means. Milestone two is easy because we're, we're in it right now. We got three projects. Uh, we do have 1 other that we're, we're pulling along on the side for IBR definitions, but it's not required for 901. If we're unable to pass uh, definitions for what is an inverter based resource. Um, we will be moving forward without it. For 901, um, we're going to assume that we can get consensus with that project to define IBR. Eventually, it will get um, passed. It may be with some additional conversations, uh, you know, with the board or with the industry that we do need to define IBR, and we'll move that into one of the projects if we're if we're able to. Um, but we want to make sure that industry has a solid consensus of what these standards will be. Um, representing. So we're going to ensure that new uh, the approach to new SARS account for existing projects. We're trying to assign uh, like to like. So for milestone through three that's coming up, we've got some projects that will be getting a new addition to their SAR um, that will have a lot more that they'll have to do, and we'll move up to high priority, and we'll get into those details. And uh, assuring that performance based modeling is done throughout effectively, we can't have individual uh, projects just running off on their own. Uh, nobody does that, but it, that could be a concern if we have requirements that don't fit with those downstream impacts. So it really has to be a meaningful approach throughout. Ball of yarn. Okay, so our next steps, this is just this year. Uh, you see January 17th, we filed the milestone one. Again, that was just the informational filing. It's completed. Uh, developing milestone three SARS is where we're at right now. We're looking to facilitate that actually with uh, the RSTC over the month of April. Uh, we've added that in just with some additional conversations with them on the front end. Like we're trying to move quickly, but we want to be inclusive. Uh, so while we've drafted these SARS, we know what needs to be in them. It does, the technical foundation document that's presented with these SARS will be the FERC order in our work plan. So it's not any new information. The, the conversation around what risks are at play with modeling is well understood. We've got lots of reports and guidelines that already, already put this information together. So there won't be anything new that needs to be presented. But we do need RSTC. Uh, RSTC support on some key items, the standard library model, how IBR, DER, that is not going to be registered, how those should be aggregated. There's already been stuff in the works for this. So it's coordinating with them, ensuring that their work, any white papers or lessons learned can be brought to the drafting team for consideration. Uh, and making sure those folks who have uh, been on the RSTC involved in those projects are up to date on the projects and involved in the process. And any of you who have been working on load forecasting and IVR DER aggregation can be in the room and providing your experience and guidance. It's new. Uh, not a lot of people have that information. DER has been something that's been hot to touch. So we've been needing to get more involved in how are we identifying what data is there. A lot of the data may not be there. So what is the aggregation method? How are you assuring that your real time monitoring and system tools are at least factoring this in? 
and to what degree those are being factored in. And can we share that information and ensure that we have like a common approach to aggregating this information? So it, there'll be some ongoing needs. Uh, guidance is not appropriate for a reliability standard requirement. Uh, what you should or could consider is never appropriate. Um, what you must do, so establishing a, you know, essentially a who, what, when, uh, who needs to do something, what they need to do, and by when, and leave a lot of the how up to individuals to have some additional um, considerations for regional factors or their own system needs, and make sure that that's being adequately represented. But we do need guidance as well, so there'll be supplementals that we'll have to probably put together for this. Ongoing coordination with RSTC is going to really help with that. Through July and September, we'll be working on the projects uh, for miles. To, oh, I'm sorry, I skipped April through June. We'll be creating these projects and assigning them to active projects. So the process here, go through April, get the, the final comments in for these initial SARs, uh, draft SARs, and then take them to the standards committee in May. That's our process to initiate a project. Uh, once we get approval of there, we will um, either assign the SARs to an active project or create a new project. Some of the projects that we want to assign to are currently low uh, or may not have started yet. Uh, I think one of the projects didn't get enough nominations to start. So rather than leave that one on the table, have it being a very similar type of data, we want to ensure that it can get started and get that, um, that same type of data SAR assigned to it. So I'll, I'll get to that briefly. Uh, July through September, we'll go ahead and start assigning the projects for milestone four, which we should have those SARS uh, developed by then. But Q3, we're looking at some flexibility there. Milestone three, we have to file standards in November of next year. So we have, even if we started today, just over a year to finish all of the milestone three modeling standard projects. Latrice um, emphasized that we were very busy. Uh, but industry is as well. So it's, it's, it, it is a lot. Uh, and we need industry to be involved and to help us get there. Uh, she said it a lot, but I think it's still understated because it's, it's so much uh, that has to happen very quickly. And that can be very complex and uh, impact compliance monitoring programs, et cetera. So we want to make sure that information is, is available as much as possible. Uh, milestone four, we do have until November of 2026. So we do have some time but it's not that much. We'll be working very heavily on the modeling projects and finalizing the performance-based ones, but we'll have to go ahead and start working on the operational and planning studies ones. There's, uh, those projects will be a little bit more, uh, I think more straightforward because it'll just be perhaps modifying existing uh, planning or operational studies to say, use this additional piece of data, use performance capability, and factor that into your decisions. So currently it seems like it might be easier, but we'll see as we go through the process, what the development from the SAR comes out, what the drafting teams determine and what industry um, provides back. So things will, will, will come out over time as those decisions are made with industry and the drafting teams. And of course, November 4th of this year will be finally milestone two. Um, that's, that's absolutely gonna be our, our next step. Uh, there's a lot of words on this slide, but uh, really on this one and the next, it's just here's our goals right now. We have uh, a couple currently active projects that are associated with modeling. So Mod 32, that first project, 2020-202, is going to be getting a milestone three SAR. Uh, the Mod 31, 2023-08, will be getting a SAR. 2020-06, will be getting a SAR. 2021-01, will be getting a SAR. We also have one up here that says 2023-05. It's FAC1, FAC2, which is interconnection standards. Interconnection is not discussed in 901. However, we don't have a timeline for that particular project, but there are a lot of commonalities behind initiating the interconnection process for developing models, what data is shared, what information is being presented, during commissioning, how is model validation being done post commissioning? Can't just operate independently or completely differently. So while it's not technically required, we are looking at building that into the solution because it can't be ignored. It has to be brought in. 
So we're looking to bring that in as a filing for November 2025. But caveat to that is that technically we do have some time on that. So it's not exactly a, um, a 901 related directive at this point for that project. We are adding, seeing uh, another SAR coming for FAC 1, FAC 2 on uh, establishing ride through uh, validation and criteria during interconnection. So that's going to be something that we're going to have more discussions on as well. So we have some stretch targets here, but we're already in the works. We're already looking at creating the SARs, beginning new projects if we need to, uh, looking at a downstream impact of, gap, of a gap analysis, you know, what impacts to uh, other standards like facility ratings. How's that impacted? Uh, we, we just need to make sure that we're, we're crossing every T here as we go through this process to ensure that the changes we make are reflected in, in all the other standards. So it'll, it'll be a process. Milestone four, currently we have some active projects assigned to TPL1 uh, or new transmission planning studies. So there's an energy assurance project, uh, 2020-203, which actually is both. It's looking at both an operational planning energy reliability assessment um, and a planning um, energy assurance assessment. Similarly, 2023-07, this project is um, actually not going to be filed in November 2026. Um, this was actually a, a FERC directive um, to be finished this year. So the the project being on this slide is is incorrect, uh, and that was something that uh, is potentially going to be reopened as a phase two. Uh, so I just want to make sure that that's clear. Like there could be an additional factor to extreme weather that may or may not need to be completed. Uh, conversations on milestone four are ongoing. We have some additional stretch targets as well. There's EMT modeling, how that's being used to ensure model validation is really essential at the local level, how you assess system strength and evaluate where there's uh, you know, particular issues at, an, uh, at a facility or in a particular area, really does necessitate the ability to do EMT studies. Uh, so we're looking at maybe an extension of that project as well. EMT is not in 901. Uh, but it does have a part to play in model validation. So, again, it's, it's something that we're considering as a factor, uh, an extension of 901 that may need to be escalated. So, model validation processes within EMT, operational planning assessments, how's EMT being used, more to come. So, coming here at the end, uh, through a lot of numbers, uh, and, and uh, project numbers at you all, but there's going to be more information on the website. We have to have ongoing communication to industry. Uh, said that several times in this presentation, but can't say it enough. It is our intent to provide as much information as we can, consolidate that, ensure that the updates on all IVR registrations, including our efforts, including the new registrations, is provided in a singular spot. We have a new uh, initiatives page or comms team has been working uh, diligently on a comprehensive like strategy for here's everything you need to know for the new registrations. And we're feeding information in with them. So regular conversations we have with um, compliance and certification, uh, legal and comms to ensure that the message is, is, is consistent, uh, that the strategy is known, that we have a, a singular approach here. Uh, if we have some updates from FERC or with FERC, we want to provide that information as well, especially on some of the, the things mentioned here today that we still have yet to determine. Uh, updates to the MRC, uh, the NERC Board of Trustees, and our new Oversight Committee to ensure that they're aware of what we're doing, when we're doing it, what our plans are, and especially if we feel we are losing traction uh, and we may not be at the place that we need to be in order to file and meet these milestone dates. We'll be doing updates to standards committees and subcommittees. We want to ensure that the RSTC is involved, the IRPTF, and the SPIDER working group. Uh, those are the two that are focused on IBR work and DER work. Uh, the individual joint uh, standard project webinars. This Thursday, we have a joint webinar on Milestone 2. So we have several projects that are either currently out on ballot or going out on ballot tomorrow. So Thursday, we'll have three of those uh, milestone two projects, which is all of them, out at the same time, staggered a little bit because they have a common uh, relation to each other. They have 
some needs uh, that need to be established by another project. So in that vein, we wanted to ensure that they were moving in lockstep. So we're able to adjust all of them at the same time. So coming out of uh, the ballot, we've already scheduled, assuming we'll have at least one additional ballot. Uh, I can always, uh, you know, hope that we'll we'll pass on the the initial, but this is uh, a lot of new standards, so it's it's unlikely. But we've already scheduled some joint sessions, so the drafting teams can even sit in a room together and make sure that we've got what approaches and what changes that we're going to make um, able to be done in tandem. And that's something that is really beneficial to the development process. So. While it's maybe not beneficial to uh, a single uh, person who's responding to all of these, we're trying to give as much information as we can and space them out, but they are so interrelated and we have to move quickly. So there's a balance here that we're trying to meet to ensure that the projects can be modified together, and uh, but also make sure that we're providing all this, as much information to industry as possible. So um with that i think i don't know latrice we had some time for questions and answers i think we still have some time remaining 15 minutes thank you thank you thank you jamie uh, jerome gabby from san diego gas and electric um this is huge i mean it's uh, like you said it's a ball of yarn and I think at this uh, cold, <laughs> cold state of, of Utah right now, we could probably use uh, some quilts or some sweaters or something to keep us warm. And this is keeping us warm and <laughs> keeping us moving. Um, my question goes to the milestones that you identified, uh, the four milestones here. They definitely and understandably are, are O&P focused, but I'm wondering if there's consideration of that SIP kind of rollout to this um, 901 ball of yarn yeah excellent question there was one um directive uh, it may have been one of the soft directives uh NERC determined through its development process like should there be cyber informed planning changes um that's actually some work that's being done uh at the rstc we're coordinating with them to say uh to make sure that we stay on track of that um obviously the changes like new equipment's being installed that will impact what is a low impact facility or medium impact facility if you now have new router and methods of communication at the facility. So there's gonna be um, some work there. There's nothing in the directives, uh, but they, they will still be moving forward as needs are identified. RSTC, if they, and anyone can write a SAR and it goes through our process, but like that body uh, technical group really leads the charge on putting some of those together. So work to do on cyber informed planning and if there's additional aspects to be considered, it's not in 901, but still a risk for sure. Okay, great, thank you, thank you. Okay, I think I'm next. Hi, um, Alice Ireland with PCS. Thank you so much for giving us this update and I think it's very thoughtful and organized, so appreciate that detail. Um, my mind is going through um, the fact that we'll have standards being developed for a group of generators, the smaller IBRs, category two, without them being registered and participating in the balloting process. Um, obviously we have IBRs registered now that are the larger ones, and, and I'm not an expert on IBRs, so I don't know technically how much is different between the bigger ones and the smaller ones. But I would imagine there are some differences that should be considered as these standards are, are developed. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about that and um, your the timing of it in, in this whole process, what your thoughts are, and how you're trying to engage those smaller IBRs without them being registered. Thank you. Thank you for that question, Alice. And um, there's still work to be done on that front. Um, if you all were at the board in February, Howard gave a presentation on the ROP revisions, as well as how that was gonna interact with the standards development world. And so what we're looking to do right now, we're gonna have an alignment process that's going to um, revise the, modify the definitions for GO and GOP. Um, and, and it'll be similar to the definitions um, of those functions as identified in the ROP. Now, please be mindful that as we go through the development process, anyone can um, provide comments through the balloting system as a guest. And we are also doing some outreach to those um, 
industry people as well to let them know this is this is who NERC is, this is what's going to be happening, this is what's going to be coming into effect and what's going to impact you. So we are in conversations about that, but just because they're not in the ballot body does not mean that they can't comment, they can comment as guests. That's helpful, thank you. My pleasure. Sounds like you guys aren't very busy. Uh, <laughs> um, I uh, Thanks for bringing up the other uh, work plan that you have, uh, IBR registration, because it's very difficult, I think, to talk about 901 work plan without talking about the other. And in the glossary of terms alignment project, um, does, does that need to be done before milestone two gets submitted? From our vantage point, I don't think it does. It does um, from, from the discussions that we've had, but what we can say, 10 minutes, he's holding up the sign. That's why you're smiling earlier. <laughs> I'm sorry, I digress. But um, as far as those definitions are concerned, I can say since we asked for an expedited pro uh, approval from FERC for those ROP changes, as soon as that is approved, we have the SAR in queue to come to the Standards Committee. And so that'll probably be a part of the prioritization too to go ahead and get that um, started as well so we can make sure that we implement that at the time that it's needed. I think it's not, like as I said, it's not needed for milestone two, but looking at milestone three and four, we will hope to have that project started and going um, to, to align with that. Okay, and is is it just generator owner and generator operator in that project or are there other definitions you're thinking of? For this particular scope of work, it's just gonna be the revisions to the GO and GOP definitions in the NERD glossier of terms. There will be more standards projects to come for the alignment. Um, I'm not sure if you were around when we did the risk-based registration, how we had alignment projects to remove those functional entities. But most likely, um, I think in Howard's presentation, he mentioned maybe non-standards that will be impacted by that. Now, we still have to do our due diligence within standards to make sure that's the only ones that will need to be updated. But it will be um, mostly to the applicability section within those standards. And if the requirements need to be revised, we'll do that as well. But we're still trying to get our, still trying to figure out the approach of how we want to draft the SAR for that alignment project. Do you have that draft list of nine standards? Yes, and we're planning to share those. However, we wanted to do our due diligence to make sure those are the only ones. But the nine standards, if I can point you to the um, agenda package for the board, um, I think they were listed in that presentation. I will double check. If you come come find me at the break, I'll make sure. If not, um, I'll, I'll find where they are in that presentation for you. Okay, thank you. My pleasure. Hi, Jamie and Nutris. This is um, Ruchisha from AS Clean Energy. I have two questions. One, as um, you were describing uh, the milestones and all the communication that uh, will be done with the industry, um, or, or the thought comes to our mind as uh, um, IBR owners and operators, one of the big challenge that we see is not having OEMs on the table. A um, lot of the standards have a lot of technical discussions going on and most of it is connected with does the inverters have the capabilities to do everything that we are proposing in the standards. It's very important to have OEMs on the table. So has NERC developed an approach to connect with the OEMs or coordinate, collaborate with them before the standards progress or get them on the table? Yeah, so where it comes is, the challenge is when it comes to standard, we can't put anything on the OEM. We can only put it on a functional entity. So we have to put the obligation on the GO and GOP, but that's not to say we want to leave it there. We want to ensure that, and, and I think RSTC does a lot of work, but specifically the IRPS, um, that, that subcommittee has vendors in, in the OEM, I think, in there. And where a lot of those issues have been kind of identified, that manufacturers have their own proprietary code uh, and logic diagrams for how it will be certain parameters will be represented in the model, and we don't want to open that up. It's it's proprietary information, and it, obviously we can anyway. Um, so it's putting an obligation for the GOs and GOPs to have a um, model quality improvement in some vein does require more coordination between the asset owners and the vendors, but the vendors need to be in the room when those discussions are being had. So. 
how they can be, um, you know, how they can be best done. What kind of guidance can we provide on the front end? And this is obviously one of the reasons why the interconnection process is so key. Uh, one of the things we hear is if you get it done in the interconnection process right the first time, you don't have to go back and spend additional money for a new model. Same with the EMT studies. If you get that done initially, you won't have to go back and get it. It'll just be part of that upfront cost, potentially. Uh, we don't have this conversation in Sanders too much, but I've heard that uh, in some of the RSDC work that's just been done, that those have been some shared concerns. Uh, but more, more to be had in those groups for developing perhaps some guidelines and workshops. I think we're looking at, I don't want to speak too soon, a potential uh, conference on IBR with um, RSTC. It's in the works potentially. Uh, we know it's needed, so it's just really a matter of time. Okay, thank you, Jamie. The second question I have is, um, as we have been thinking about the milestones and the implementation of this, one of the big concerns, again, as a uh, IBR owners we have is supply chain and implementation of the standards. It's great we will have a standard, but we need time to implement this. Some of these standards requires equipment to be installed, configured. So has there been a consideration as May 2026 is ticking, it's the time, right? And so has there been any consideration provided or considered for this? Okay. Okay, uh, yeah, just on the same for disturbance monitoring, I think was that um, that standard. So having a known, known information being provided up, which units won't be able to meet the deadline, uh, not so much to file for an extension, uh, but to ensure that there's a corrective action plan in place on the front end. So you can't, we have to provide considerations for supply chain issues and things outside the entities controls. And it's not, it's not a new thing. We've done that with TPL seven for GMD equipment. Um, so transformers as well for, um, for GMD studies, there's a potential cap or corrective action plan for you have to change out your transformer and you can't just install it tomorrow. And if you need an extension because of supply chain issues or something outside of your control, that there's a process in place for that. And we're looking at something similar. Great. Uh, good morning. Srinivas Kapagantula from Arivan Energy. A uh, couple, maybe one observation and maybe one question. Uh, second, uh, what Ruchi just said involving kind of the right people. Uh, and even what Alice said probably earlier would be would be the best when you are actually trying to draft some of these standards for folks that are not currently in the room. So, uh, you know, I think at the RSTC, Mark Lobby uh, said that there was going to be some kind of outreach to the industry to get the right folks on the drafting teams. Uh, for all the SARS that you mentioned, uh, at least the ones that are going to come to the RSTC pretty soon, uh, are all those SARS being drafted by the RSTC, or are you drafting the SARS and giving the RSTC an opportunity to simply comment on them? The latter. We're, we're initiating those for timing. Uh, we're, as I said, for milestone three, we have until November of next year. So we're trying to move quickly. The, the objectives are known. Um, so we want to go through that process for um, incorporating comments, but it'll also go through a whole SAR revision or review process as it gets initiated by the standards committee. So there'll be uh, another opportunity for collecting information, revising the SAR, uh, and making sure that it uh, it meets all of the expectations and objectives. Great. So when you form the standard drafting teams, can you publish that information by sector, as opposed to who's on uh, who's on the drafting team? Because I believe if you publish that information by sectors, you would actually know which whether the right folks are on the standard drafting teams. Because right now it's all done by segments. And a bunch of the IBRs that you actually want on those standard drafting teams are not there. That that's a good point. Um, and and at this time, I can't commit to that. But what I will say is, we have um, an initiative right now, which is actually a, a work plan priority, to where we're reviewing the registered ballot body um, to make sure that we have the right people um, in the ballot body to vote on those standards. So you make a good point um, with with looking at that. So there's more to come with that. The last thing that I would like to add to that. Knowing that, you know, we have these drafting teams and we have these meetings, these are public meetings, so anyone can attend these meetings um, and, and become observers or active observers during this process. So I encourage, um, you know, 
all of you who, who are in contact with these entities to, to let them know that, you know, everything you do is transparent, it's public. And so we put those invites on our calendar um, so anybody can come to those drafting teams. Uh, that's great. I'm going to slightly disagree with you over there. Although they are public, it would be much better if you sought out who these right folks are, as opposed to saying, hey, everything is public. Everybody can come and attend these meetings and provide an input. Right. Thank right. you for so, that. Thank you. Thanks. Mm -hmm. So we're running out of time at this yes. point. So I apologize. We don't have any time for more questions, but I want to thank um, Latrice and Jamie um, for their presentation today. There's a lot of questions. You can meet with them after the break and uh, at, or at lunch as well. So thank you again. So now we're going to take a break. If everyone will come back at 11 o'clock and we'll get a, the next session started at that time. So thank you. <laughs>